Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, host of the Football History Dude podcast, right here on the Sports History Network. Now, before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's sponsor. We partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. They even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site, so there's something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day, or maybe Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups, and they choose to pass these savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to shop rsa.com forward slash shn again that's shop rsa.com forward slash shn head over there to get your piece of sports history today this is our league and this is your league from the 55 yard line on cfl america radio and the sports history network And welcome to the newest episode here of Gridiron America. This is Greg James here in Japan. And I am very pleased today to talk to somebody who I've wanted to talk to for a very long time. Uh, and that is uh, my friend Kyle Smith with the USFL Project. And we are talking, we are, go, we are stepping back into the DeLorean, is, uh, is, is our new, the football dude, uh, football history dude likes to say. And uh, we're stepping in the DeLorean and we're going back to the 80s to talk us some uh, USFL. And uh, when it comes to, to leagues, comes to defunct leagues, the USFL is near and dear to a lot of hearts, including, including mine, but especially Kyle and the guys at the project. And uh, Kyle, thank you very much for joining me here during March Madness. And as we Man, talk, we got Ken. Oh, Thanks you're for welcome. having me. I appreciate it. It's been a long time coming, hasn't it? It has been. It has been. And I, I you know, thank you for making for for doing this during a time where we're both up. It's both kind of. It's it. The timing is perfect because we're not either too tired, or neither one. I'm not like trying to get up, like getting up too early, or you're going to bed too late. It's like right in the sweet spot. So, um, and um, but hey, how how are things looking for your school right now with uh? with the game where are we at with uh you're watching the get you got the game on in the background there how are we doing basketball wise you know what let's do a live update right now we've got oh my gosh we've got a we've got fdu fairly dickinson university now up by two. Oh, sweet 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 and final quarter or fine i'm sorry final half yeah final half about 17 and a half left to go uh in the second half and and fairly Dickinson has made a run and uh we're we're excited about it. Oh, I I'm envious cuz uh my alma mater has never even sniffed the tournament. So <laughs> my my alma mater has sniffed the tournament a couple of times but it's few and far between. So uh yeah. shout out to the University of Wyoming. We hope to uh hope to get back there soon. Mm, nice. Jim Kicks old school. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Jim so. Kick and Jay Novacek. Yeah. And um um God, somebody else right now. It's escape the name's escaping me. One of the stars in the NFL. Um oh uh I, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Give it's, give us about five minutes and we'll come up with it. Right, right. <laughs> well now now one of the stars of the um the current XFL is Brian Hill. 
Oh, I didn't realize he went to yeah, Miami. Brian Brian Hill. Brian Hill is Powder River Letter Buck. Wow. Wow. And it's funny because Wyoming, I mean, their stadium there, I know we're digressing here, but you know, you don't think of Wyoming about football, but then you see that stadium and you're like, man, if I lived in Wyoming, man, I'd be, I'd, I'd be buying season tickets just cause just, and it's a beautiful, not only is it a beautiful stadium, but the backdrop of, of that stadium with the mountains and everything is just amazing. Yeah, it's, it, it really is. It, now in, in Wyoming, the, the tailgating kind of takes precedent over the game. Sometimes it's similar to uh, TCU because I was, I lived in the Fort Worth area for a while yeah. and the, the the tailgating actually takes precedent, but they are the the Wyoming Cowboys fans are uh, very passionate, which is a word that we'll get into later as well. But yeah. they're they're very passionate. They they love the school. They they support the school because it it wasn't too long ago that they were talking about Wyoming possibly dropping to at that point one double a really now it's you know now it's a different name now but yeah but yeah they, so i'm like you i'd still it'd always be one double a or one a to me because mm -hmm. that's what we grew up with um yep. I, I didn't realize i didn't know that they were talking about pay, possibly i'm glad they didn't i mean it's you know do you think they'll ever make it do you ever think you think at this point the way the SEC is going, you think they'll ever make a push into Wyoming to try to get Wyoming, schools like Wyoming? Because I can see that's where we're going, or becoming a Big Ten school. I, you know, I don't think so. I, I think the enrollment at Wyoming and and the national interest in Wyoming will probably keep them out of out of the big conferences. Now, at some point, the way it's looking, it looks like college football is going to become basically two or three big conferences and right. everybody else is going to go by the wayside. So yeah. if that happens, there's a small possibility, but I, I just don't see Wyoming gaining the interest. I mean, you know, Josh Allen really put him on the map and it uh, it's the that number. Long. That's the name I was looking. I was, I was trying to remember Josh Allen played at Wyoming. Yeah, I mean that when when the Bills took that gamble and and took that high of a pick on Josh Allen, and after his first year, all the all the naysayers came out and and said, you know, Buffalo wasted that pick. They got a quarterbacks coach in. They coached him up. Now you know yeah. now he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and that's where you know that's where Wyoming really got their um, their step up, but. To see them in a major conference, it would probably take the NCAA going down to three major conferences for Wyoming to ever get a shot at that. Okay. Yeah, no, it's it's funny because the world, I mean, the world that we grew up in, and I kind of, you know, they always say the good old days aren't always that good, but I, I do kind of miss the old days when it was the bowl game was it. And then you had your national champion picked. Now, again, I'm from Illinois, so it's not like any of our schools in the state had any skin in the game whatsoever. Uh, but there was just something about a purity. Just, I don't know. It may, again, I'm putting on my 12 year, my 10 year old rose color glasses. And because what we got now, it, it's so different college mm -hmm. football, the feel of it, um, everything. It's just so different from what we grew up with. And, and that's, and that's why we're here talking and, you know, talking USFL. Um, so when it comes to the USFL, how did the USFL talking about nostalgia and everything? Cause I know that's what it was born out of. Obviously the USFL project began well after the USFL lived and died. How did the US, how did the USFL project come to be? <laughs> so, you know, it's it's kind of a strange story. Um, my love for the USFL was reinvigorated in my twenties, and I had I had gotten an email from a company that said they were hosting, and I'll never forget this: they were hosting Mike Rozier and Archie Griffin for an autograph signing, and it was it was like I became you know nine years old again. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, those two are both 
USFL alums. They're both Heisman Trophy winners. And so I went and found a company that had these USFL helmets. I don't know if they made them or, or if they sold them. I ordered a couple. I contacted the company who was doing the signings. And I sent those two helmets off to the signings. When I got them back in the box, it was like, it, I mean, I'm literally like opening Christmas presents. I was like, I knew, I know what's in here, but I haven't seen it. Right. Because, you know, at that time, they weren't sending pictures of, you know, the signing, the signed items and stuff like that. So I'm opening the box and it's just like Christmas. And when I pulled them out, I pulled out a beautiful Pittsburgh Maulers helmet signed by Mike Rozier in white and a beautiful Jacksonville Bulls helmet mm. signed by Archie Griffin, signed in jet black. And I decided to start the USFL project. Now, I started the USFL project as a page. And then the group came later. And I'll talk to you about that here in a minute. But I, I remember... I, that's how I stumbled across the USFL project was finding the page. Yeah. And, and the page was started here. Here was my ultimate goal. You, are you ready for this big multi-million dollar idea that I had that was going to just take over the world and I was going to end up being times magazine man of the year. <laughs> here, here's the idea. I wanted to get one helmet from each team in the USFL signed by one of the main players right. from, from that team. That was the goal that it was 19. It was supposed to be 19 helmets and I was going to be done. And then as it evolved, I was getting, I was getting more comments. I was getting more, you need to do this. I was, I was actually getting people that were sending me links to signings going, Hey, I know that you don't have anybody from the Tampa Bay Bandits and this this player is doing a signing in Tampa in in April. Yeah. I mean I I was legitimately getting help from the people on the page. Oh, nice. And we started getting requests for, you know, where is this person now? Where where is so and so? Where is so and so? And so I started the group so that people could share news about you know, about the alumni and about what they were doing, how, you know, everything, everything good, everything positive. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not always rainbows and unicorns, but, right. you know, we, we wanted to have that group where people could share their love for the USFL. And in a very, very small part, we could be part of keeping the USFL history alive. And you guys have done a hell of a job doing it because I mean, when the internet, the the great thing about the internet was when it started guys like you and me who are passionate about football passionate about leagues that we loved well now we we've got we we find we found a place all of us can we, we found our tribe mm -hmm. and that's i remember when i stumbled yeah. upon the usfl project i'm like oh wow okay i'm not the only one that still loved it you know I'm like, okay, I'm not, there's somebody out there that cares. So that's what, um, when I found you guys and it, it's been a while ago, I mean, you guys been going long for how long now? Oh, we've been going well over 15 years. Yeah. I mean, that just tells you, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, you guys have a Facebook page and you've got an independent website too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And, now, um, the, now the web, the website's still under construction where, you know, right. we, we're, the group that's doing this, and I and I have to give a quick shout out, and I, I don't like doing commercials during podcasts and everything, but I have to give a, a shout out. Um, you know, Tom Cadle, um, Rob, Beth, Channing, our our admin team and our moderator Yeah, you guys team. got a you guys have a great crew. I know yeah, it's and, not, yeah. They Everybody does it for the love of the USFL. We no nobody gets paid, nobody makes a dime. I mean, it's all on our own time. But I I legitimately have the best team I could have possibly assembled. If I would have gone out to ZipRecruiter and put out you know an ad to come up with this admin team, I would not have come up with a better admin team that I have right now. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, it's too bad you guys aren't aren't making money you know 
you thank God you're doing it for free because that's really the best way to do any of our our football fandom stuff. But yeah, I am retired and kind of looking for new work, so I'm like, oh no, you guys aren't paying any. Oh man, but I would <laughs> definitely, I definitely be happy to join your team if 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 a spot were available because I love. I mean, yeah, much like you got. I mean, it's just the nostalgia. Um, it's the nostalgia, the memory. I mean, you and I, as you and I were talking before we hit the record button, I can still vividly remember where I was as a kid when I first heard the USFL was starting. That that memory is kind of more fuzzy, but I vividly remember watching that very first USFL game. And it was the Chicago Blitz, the Washington Federals. Mm-hmm. It was a rainy day. Um, um, Hoency was a quarterback for the Federals. Greg Landry was the quarterback of the Blitz, and he had George Allen on the sidelines. And as a kid, 15-year-old kid, remembering a lot of these players from back in the NFL during the 70s, it was like uh, there was that moment, and again, I was watching the game, and for those who are listening that don't remember, but there was a time when all we could, you know, most people watch their TV via an aerial TV with a bit of snow... You know, I mean, it wasn't the best. I lived on the outskirts of Chicago. So uh, at times, you know, the, the reception wasn't the best, depending upon the weather. That's how we watched it. And that was, you know, we had a pregame show. I forget um, the USFL had a pregame show that led right into that. And boom, we were ready to go. There wasn't any of this hype, the build up, the social media. It was what you read in the paper. It was what you saw on news clips on TV. And boom, you're ready to go. So, and that's so that's those are my first memories of the USFL. So, um, and and one of the uh, one of the commentators was, oh, let me tell you about Keith Jackson. Oh yeah, yep, <sighs> Keith Jackson and Len Swan, and uh, Jim Lampley was doing uh, was in the was at the studio. Yes, he was. And uh, let me give a quick shout out to Mike Hoensey. He's a he he is a Mike great Hope, fan uh, of the USFL project. He's, uh, I mean, I. I followed Mike because he was USFL alumni, yeah. but he's actually a very great motivator. And I love, I love seeing his posts about motivating young athletes. He's still involved in the game. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what's he, uh, and I'm, I'm um, cause he was, you know, he was head coach at head coach of Chicago rush for years. Mm-hmm. I saw him coaching. Um, is he still in the Chicago area? Is he still coaching or I mean, what's, is he, um, you know, I don't, I, I wouldn't really feel comfortable talking about oh, what no, that's area fine, that's he's fine. in, but, um, but yeah, he's, he is still very involved in, Good. in football and, and he's, he's really doing a lot to shape, um, young football players into what they need to be to step up to the next level. And that's one of the things I really, really appreciate about Mike is that, um, he, he still has that fire. And yeah. he's passing that fire on to, um, on to the next generation of, of kids that we're going to see playing at the collegiate and pro level. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I've always, I always enjoyed him as a coach of the rush. Cause that's where, I mean, saw him play obviously for the federals. Um, but you know, for me being from Chicago, I mean, he's very well known. He's, he's very well known in Chicago, you know, for his time, um, with the rush and unfortunately, you know, we're not talking arena football league, but you know, there's another league too that, um, <laughs> you know, people still have a great passion for and our buddy, Tim Capper, um, on the sports history network, he, he does his arena football league, uh, uh, podcast too. So, uh, yeah. you know, shout out to Tim, if he's listening, uh, uh he's, you he's know, got what? a great I'll podcast. T- I'll, I'll tell you what I own. I own two arena football league many helmets and they're both signed by the man the myth the legend and somebody who's become a dear friend to me the sack man john corker nice and they are from the miami hooters oh one of the best names ever in football it was uh yeah that was just like the hooters and then you see the oh i remember when i first saw that like the miami hooters that's a great that's oh, a it's a great, great name. It, yeah. it was a great concept. And, and and since the Arena Football League's coming back, Hooters should invest again. They should do that again because that is a great concept. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Bring it. You know what? And it's much like here in Japan. So in Japan, the team names are um, based upon the company that sponsors them. Mm -hmm. So that'd be a great concept for the Arena Football League. You know, throw the company name in there that sponsors the team, like the Hooters, like Hooters Wings. You know, I mean, thinking, you know, um, because here in Japan, our football teams, like with the X League and everything, I mean, it's based on the company. Um, you know, the Fujitsu Frontiers, you've got the Panasonic Impulse. Um, but yeah, for the Arena League moving forward, maybe they'll think, hey, maybe we should, you know, slap a slap a company logo on there. Hopefully that will help it stick around for a lot longer than than, you know, hopefully it'll make make for a successful comeback. So Yeah, and uh, and and two things. One, I, I don't know if this is still the case because I, I followed minor league baseball for a long time and I followed professional baseball, obviously, but um, I went over a lot of years ago, probably 15, 16 years ago. And I was a guest of Bobby Valentine and he was the manager of the Chiba Lote yeah. Maroons at the time. Yeah. I don't know if that's still the, the team name. Yeah. Still a team but, name. He's a legend here in Japan. Yeah. I, I spent, I spent six or seven days over in Chiba with him and got really? a whole a, a whole new appreciation for baseball because when when you listen to the fans in the crowd and they have different chants for every single player oh yeah it, it's incredible to listen to that stadium it is yeah it is the baseball here is it's so entertaining to watch um with the world baseball classic watching there there've been five games here in Japan I watched four because the Japanese team is so dominant that I thought the semi, the quarterfinal game with Italy was a practice game because they were just, the Japanese team is just completely unstoppable. So, but yeah, you see this baseball, and it, you know, with baseball being such a national passion here. Um, and I know people maybe have heard me do my other podcast, Gridiron Japan. Um, there's three of us over there that host that podcast and it's john gunning with the japan times it's bj bd former star of the obic seagulls and we're like man football could be so big in this country and you see what baseball is here and it's just we always lament that it's like oh man football could be so big here because of the teamwork it just represents everything about japan that the japanese hold dear teamwork self-sacrifice um you know not putting yourself, not putting your numbers above somebody else's numbers, at least theoretically. I mean, we know you and I both know back in the States that a lot of football players don't quite think that way, but you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that and uh, you know, the, the funny thing about Japan was Bobby was the first one that taught me that cold sake is actually the higher end sake. Yeah. Because um, Americans do what they do and they Americanized it. And so they started creating, you know, doing this warm sake. And the warm sake is actually the cheap stuff. The cold sake is the way to go. And I did not know that. But I got got a great education from Bobby on a lot of things. Yeah, it's funny. Last night, my father-in-law was over. He's 85 years old, can barely walk, but he's doing good. He brought his shochu over. Like you want show you? I go, no, no, that's that stuff will fuck 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 me up when it <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Japanese beer. I'm sure you had when you were over there over here that oh, yeah. you're full of Japanese beer. Japanese beer here is the best. Though with that said, I do miss at home with the craft beers because there's so many, you know, America has changed so much in the last say 40 years. Um, we'll use 80, 83 would be a good starting point because that's you know when the USFL started that you know trying to describe to somebody here in japan what the beer select i go it's just we have such we have too many choices in america but that when it comes to beer that's okay though you know you think back to when you know the usfl started in 83 we didn't have a whole lot of choices much like tv channels and stuff like that so um you know so when the usfl started again we didn't have a lot of choices we had the nfl and that was pretty much it. So for people who don't know, when it comes to the USFL, the USFL just didn't spring up overnight. There was, this had been percolating, not so much for months or years, but hell, 
for at least a decade. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to people how the USFL came about? So David Dixon, who is a genius in my opinion, he had the idea for the United States Football League in the 60s. And he, he moved forward with this plan to create a new league, basically to go head to head with the NFL. Now, what happened is during that point, the NFL basically offered him a franchise, which became the New Orleans Saints. And so David Dixon became very involved with the New Orleans Saints for almost 20 years, maybe even a little right. over 20 years. And then when he got out from the Saints, he was like, you know, this idea still works. And so he went to um, several different investors and said, hey, I've got this idea for a spring football league. And let me let me say this. When we talk about spring football leagues, there are a lot of people today that don't realize how much influence the USFL had. The USFL was not going after players that the NFL let go. The USFL was going after players that were actively involved in the draft. And you can see it when you look at the history of the USFL. You look at Jim Kelly, Steve Young, Irv Eatman, Sam Mills. Uh, I mean, they, they, now Sam Mills, Sam Mills is a great, uh, a great case for the USFL because he was a player that was shunned by the NFL. They said he was too small. They said he was too light. They said he couldn't play. And the USFL said, come on, come, come over here, come play. And we actually, and again, in a very, very small part, we actually got involved in the campaign last year to get Sam Mills inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame which he should have been inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame 10 years ago. Right. And I'm being very, very gracious on that. But we got involved in the, um, in the campaign to, to get him inducted into the Hall of Fame. And we're, we're very proud to just have a small part in that. But, but the US, again, the USFL, they, they went, they, they're the only league, and man, Richie Franklin, if you're listening, I'm sorry. I know that we don't agree on this because he is very big on the World Football League history. But the USFL, in my opinion, is the only football league that has ever gone head-to-head -head with the NFL, except for um, the AFL, which was absorbed right. by the right. NFL. Those are the only two leagues, in my opinion – that have ever gone head to head with the NFL. Yeah. And I agree. Cause I mean, I know enough about world football league history to know that uh, while they attempted to go head to head, they fell far, far, far short. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting, the WFL is a great, uh, how do you want to want to say great lesson learned in hubris and uh, overconfidence, but the USFL, it was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call the USFL. I mean, there's, when the USFL started, like you said, it went head to head. It grabbed talent immediately and served as a wake up notice to the NFL that, hey, just because you have them, don't think, you know, don't get too comfortable with yourself. Because back at that time, salaries were really low. Um, you know, a lot of, I mean, the stadiums that we have now were just completely science fiction back then, because back then in the, in the, say late seventies, early eighties, you know, about half the league played in baseball parks. And when the USFL there, there is a moment in, in football history where you kind of see things really changing. And when the USFL came on board, that's when the world that we know now started to exist, started to come into being. Yeah, exactly. Because the, the salaries in the NFL would not be at the, at the amounts that they are without the USFL because the NFL finally had competition and they and the USFL to their credit and to their detriment 
the USFL was paying players what they should have been paid and, and maybe even a little bit more. The right. problem was that David Dixon, David Dixon had a great plan to go up against the NFL. He had a fantastic plan, but the owners did not follow that plan because they got that, they got that taste of success. Right. And then they started spending and, you know, you can, uh, you can look at the original 12 teams and, and see that they, they just overspent. I mean, the Michigan Panthers, they bought basically the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive line. Mm -hmm. They just went, they just went out and bought them. And, you know, as, as much as the Panthers are beloved, the owner of the Panthers w was part of the problem along with the other owners. They got that sweet taste of success and they went out and started overspending. And that's part of part of the demise of the U.S. Part of the demise of the USFL started in the first season, whether right. people want to acknowledge that or not. It was in the first season when the owners were overspending that the USFL was already starting to go downhill with such a great product. Yeah. I mean, they, they were, they were maxing out the credit cards that they had and then some, and a lot of these owners, well, maybe on paper, they looked financially good. The reality was, is they were cashing checks that their bank accounts could not, they were, they were, they were writing out checks that their bank accounts could not possibly cash. It they were robbing Peter. They were robbing Peter to pay Paul. Right. Right. And so when they came into the league, so when we first started with the USFL, we had 12 teams and, you know, those 12 teams were in 12, 12 US, um, those 12 teams were in 12 cities, some of which were NFL team cities, some of which were not. Um, and he had some great, I mean, like the Denver gold is like one of those teams that nobody really ever talks about with USFL history. It seems like, and to me, they were one of the more successful franchises in the USFL. I think they can. And again, I'm a Red Miller fan and Red Miller coached at Western Illinois University and went to Western Illinois, which is where I went. So I'm kind of I was very partial to once I found out Red Miller was a, was a leatherneck. I'm like, oh, OK, now I've got. And then so I started looking a little bit deeper and say Denver Broncos history, but Denver Gold history, too. But with the franchise, they were one of the more relatively successful ones. Um, would you agree with that? I mean, am, am I wrong on that? No, I absolutely agree with that because they had they had great attendance almost through the entire three years of the USFL. They went through a major coaching change when Craig Morton ended up taking over. Yeah. I mean, they they went through a lot and those fans, those fans did not care. They showed up and they rooted on that team no matter who was in charge, no matter who was on the field. The the Denver Gold are probably one of the unsung heroes of the USFL because that that town embraced that team and they put them on their shoulders and they were they tried to carry them yeah. they really did yeah and then you go to the another extreme you put a team out in LA put the express out there and you put them in uh, you know what i mean yeah i mean you put them in the Memorial Coliseum, and obviously that, uh, at least visual-wise, when you tune in to see a game, yeah, I mean, you might have 20, let's just say hypothetically 20,000 or 30,000 in a game. It's still going to look like nobody's at the game, unfortunately. But as it turned out, really nobody was going to those LA Express games. You know, and that that's the problem with, with, the, um, with the cities that have entertainment. Yeah. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on... I'm going to pick on LA, but I'm going to pick on another franchise because it, it's just one of those cities. There's too much to do. LA, the, the people have shown time and time again that they don't care about professional football. There, there are too many entertainment options in LA. They're out, they're out dining, they're out traveling, they're out hiking. There's too many things to do in LA for LA to substantiate any kind of professional, almost professional sport. The only the only exception is the Lakers because the Lakers have that history and there will always be fans at Lakers games. The Clippers right. have just have just come about in our lifetime because I mean the Clippers were like 
one season away from getting, you know, moved somewhere else because nobody was going to Clippers games. Yeah. But the other city I see in our conversation is Orlando. They took the Washington Federals, moved them to Orlando, and there there is there's way too much to do in Orlando. The nightlife, the 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 scene, everything. And I think you're seeing that with the Orlando Guardians of the XFL now. The Was people it? of Orlando have way too many options that they they're just not going to go to to pro sports. So when the Orlando, so when Washington moved to Orlando in terms of attendance, so the or, the attendance in Orlando it fall, pretty much fall flat on its face because I that eighty five season in my memory is still fuzzy because that was college yeah, years. Remember. Yeah, college years. That again. That <laughs> that again. Um, you know, I think I think with Orlando there were a lot of different problems. The the, the fans in Washington wanted them to stay. I, I don't real well, I've got a I've got a little bit of an idea, but I'm still kind of piecing that story together. Yeah. But the fans in Washington did not want to lose the Federals. And I think Orlando came in presenting a option that wasn't really there. Because right. if you remember Howard Schnellenberger was supposed to be the coach of the Orlando Renegades. Yeah, that's right. And he came in and then he abruptly left. And luckily for the Renegades, they got Lee Corso, who, you know, fabulous man, good head coach. He just couldn't do anything with Orlando, probably because the team was out partying at all hours. (laughs) I don't, you know, I don't know, but, um, but yeah, you know, L.A., Orlando, those big cities, they, you know, with the nightlife, they struggle. Yeah. If, if you don't if you don't handle your business and don't, you know, make sure that the guys are, you know, right. in by 10 o'clock or whatever, it's those are hard cities to um, those are hard cities to have pro sports in. Yeah. And then we had the Chicago we had the Chicago Blitz and the Arizona Wranglers, too. In the annals of sports history, it's one of the strangest stories ever in terms of franchise moves and relocations. And to me, I look at that right there. And it, it, when I look at all that happened there, very symbolic of, in many ways, why the league eventually went away because you had, it, it just seemed, I just, the, the, the ownership situation with both of those franchises just still boggles my mind after all these years how they were able to swap franchises and ultimately you know chicago wasn't around in 85 yeah and that that franchise swap shouldn't have happened but you know unfortunately that's that's one of the that's one of the many things that the usfl is remembered for um and you know, it. I guess historically, it's um, you know, it's kind of neat to look back on. I mean, there's a lot of different things with the USFL. There were a lot of innovations with, um, you know, the challenge flag, the right, um, you know, this, that, the other that you can look at the USFL, the the franchise swap between Chicago and Arizona, um, the the Breakers being the only team in professional history that have held the same name, but have been in three different cities, three different Boston, cities. New Orleans, and Portland. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many oddities with the USFL that make it, that make it great. And I think, I think that's why we're passionate about it because there's so many things that came out of the USFL that were oddly fantastic. And it was, and it's like, it's still like, to me, the greatest, what if like, man, cause they had some great teams. You had the Philadelphia stars. And I know you and I had, talked about this on twitter just messaging back and forth but you know it wasn't until recently in the last couple of years um you know i got involved playing simulation football mm-hmm. through dave cook sports they've got a great program and i'm like well what if the philadelphia stars and the san francisco to play each now there's at least a way computer wise to figure out how the usfl would have stacked up 
it could be way off base, but for guys like you and I, that when we talk football, we become 12 year olds again. And it's like, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's give this a shot, but I haven't done it yet to, to play each other's champions. But the USFL to me represents the greatest what if, and I know people get wound up and this is where, you know, uh, was it two year and a half ago, sat down with Jeff Pearl, Scott and I, and we talked about his book, which football for a buck is, you know what, that is a great weekend read. No matter, you know, Perlman's awesome. He writes, I went a little bit too fanboy on him during the interview and I, I still feel bad about that. But when I talk to great authors for books, I love, I really, I mean, hell, I talked to Brett Forrest uh, last week talking about his great book about the XFL long bomb, which if you haven't read or uh, for people who have not read the book, it is ooh, well worth reading because it, uh, much like uh, football for a book, it's a great tale and you just walk away from it going, okay, now I better understand. And, um, but people get, when it comes to the USFL, a lot of attention is paid to one man, which I don't think is really fair and without going into politics or anything, but the USFL, like you said, was kind of going, uh, was, was starting to dig its own grave. Sorry, I'm having a I'm having oh, a that, communication issue here. Oh, that's okay. I can hear you. You're good. I see you plugging in something over there. I hope, I you, hope good? you can edit me here because. Oh yeah, no, no, we got it. We got you. Perfect. Yeah. All right. We got if you. you could, if I you see, would be did safe. you just plug in a land cord? I did. Oh no, you're perfect, man. It's we're no. No, I, I plugged whatsoever. in a charging cord because my oh. uh, my phone battery has decided. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. All right. So if you gotcha. could throw that question at me one more okay. time, I'd appreciate um, it. Yeah. So when it comes to USFL, talking about you know, there's a lot of there are a lot of fingers to blame and a lot of people, but I think one person who gets kind of unfairly targeted is, is Trump. And I say that because people, you know, we all know how it ended with, with the league, but he bought into the league the second year. So the troubles with the league did not start with him. They may have ended with him, but they started with him. And when it comes to when he bought into the league, I don't recall. I mean, I know he was spending, I mean, did he spend even more money on the generals than what was being spent elsewhere? You know, there, there are stories out there that, um, that the reason Trump bought into the USFL is because the NFL told him that he couldn't buy the Buffalo bills. And that, that story has been out there, uh, you know, since, since before the usfl was alive right. and you're right there are i'm going to go to this word again but there are fanatics out there that want to put the blame completely on trump now let me say this and let me be clear i have feelings about donald trump i'm not going to share those I'm not going to talk about it. That's not something we talk about in the USFL project. Right. We, that's one of the rules is we do not talk politics or derogatory or anything else. That being said, Donald Trump is not the reason right. that the USFL failed. There were, there were a ton of different problems. And again, it goes back to the owners not following the Dixon plan. And Had they just... followed the Dixon plan, right. this I don't think this would have been an issue, yeah. but they didn't follow it. So Trump may, may very well have been the nail in the coffin, but he was not the reason that right. the USFL went away. Right. And that's, you know, when I talk to people, you know, obviously not while recording a podcast or anything, but just talking in general, because you know what, there's a lot of people out there. When you mention the USFL, first of all, a lot of people don't even remember what the USFL was, especially, you know, people that are say 20 years younger than us that love uh -huh. football that, you know, and we're going to talk about what's been happening in the 21st century with spring football here in a little bit, but don't know about, and that about the history of spring football 
And not knowing the history of the USFL to me, when it comes to being a football fan, it's almost like, you know, I don't know if you're a football fan, I think it's great to be a football fan, but I think to really, to really understand football, you've got to be able to look back. You need to take time and just appreciate the history, which is why thank God for NFL films because without NFL films, and I'll say this, it is a bit of a propaganda arm, but without that propaganda arm, this, this guy right here would not be the fan he is because of John Facenda, Steve Sable, the music, the everything about it. And same way with the USFL, because when the USFL came about, and you're younger than me, it made a deep, deep impression on you that lasts until this day. And even with me. Now, obviously, you can see we're not doing video here, but if people could see, I've got quite a bit of football stuff in the background. My USFL pennants did make the trip to Japan. Unfortunately, I can't put them up here because I my place is rented. Um, but also my USFL mini helmets, my other USFL stuff is still sitting in a, in a garage in California waiting, waiting to come over here at some point. Um, but when it comes to the USFL, without it, nothing else. I mean, like you said, the USFL is the reason why I think pro football, you can make an argument why pro football is so popular today because that woke the, the NFL up saying, okay, we got to up our game here because 20 years later, you know, the game is 20, 40 years later, the game is, is more science fiction is less science fiction than it was say 40, 40 years prior. But a lot of the innovations brought about by the USFL and these other spring leagues have now since been adopted by the NFL. And what we're watching nowadays is very much kind of like back when I was a great in grade school, there was a great sports illustrated article about the future of football. And if you read it now, 40 years on, or actually almost 50 years on, it's amazing how many of these predictions got right in terms of um, let's just say with, with camera angle shots and everything like that. So I'm sorry. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going on here. Um, when it comes to the innovations that the USFL made, Tell people what those were, because I think people, a lot of people just don't know what the USFL brought to modern day football. I mean, the, the big innovations were, were the uh, challenge flag, right? Which they had to use a rotary phone. Do you think anybody that's listening knows what a rotary phone is? Cause I know yeah. you and I are very well versed on the rotary phone, especially the one with the 20 foot cord. So you, you can yeah. walk to the house. Well, and, I would say about half the people do, because I know with Sports History Network, it's a Sports <laughs> History Network. So, you know, about half our people remember, you know, you know, still remember those rotary phones. But the other half? Yeah, no, they don't. Or the old school, um, the, the the touch button ones, but they were still made of the same indestructible plastic as the rotary ones. But they were a little absolutely. less. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the other thing was the uh, the two point conversion. I yeah. mean, the two-point conversion really became a, a a big deal in the USFL, and so, you know, you can link the you can link the USFL back to a lot of innovations in football. And for me, that's that's what we're that's what we're aiming for is yeah. all of these players now have kids and grandkids and maybe great grandkids, and we we want to reach those people we want to reach those kids so because a lot of the players that played in the usfl that was their only pro football experience right and and we want those kids grandkids great grandkids we want them to have a place where they can go and see oh my gosh my my dad my grandpa my great grandpa he played in this football league that's that's why it's so important for us because when you and i are gone yeah. If there's nobody to carry over the history past us and there's nobody responsible enough to tell it correctly, right. then, then it's gone. And I, and, and we, we as a team do not want that. We want the USFL to be projected the way it was, which was one of the only competitors to the NFL and a true professional football league. And 
you know, yeah, I, yeah, that's what I, that's what, you know, you and I were talking a little bit before we hit the record button and we were talking about documentaries. And when it comes to the USFL, not only your website, but there's that one documentary that we have from ESPN 30 for 30, small potatoes about the history of the, of the USFL. Are there any more documentaries coming out that you're aware of with the USFL? Anything on the table that you've heard? I have, and this has been, this has been years, but I've heard of a couple of documentaries that may be, uh, may be coming out about specific teams or specific people but I think they are still working on funding. Okay. Cause I know there's one on YouTube and that's going to kind of segue into my next topic here, which I know you're, you, oh, I think you're going to love my, my question about the next topic, but there's one documentary about the Tampa Bay bandits that's on yes. YouTube that you can watch for free. So here's the one question I have for you that I really, I haven't really talked to anybody about, but the Tampa Bay ownership group, there was one man involved in that that was at the time one of the was the biggest movie star in America, and that was Burt Reynolds. And his involvement with John Bassett, and John Bassett is another. I mean, without John John Bassett, I don't even know how to. You could, I'd have to let you maybe take the floor on that one to describe John Bassett how how um, legendary a figure he is in sports not only with the world football league, but with the world hockey league, I'm sorry, the world hockey association, but he owned the Tampa Bay bandits and Burt Reynolds was part owner of that. Have you guys drilled deep on the history of the bandits there at the USFL project in terms of, you know, Burt's involvement with John Bassett? I mean, that's to me, that's always like been a fascinating part of this league's history. Just, you know, for those that just, you know, there's a picture of Lonnie Anderson in a Tampa Bay Bandits shirt out there, like on a football card. So, you know, culturally, I mean, this, the USFL was, was part of pop culture back in the eighties. So what, what can you tell me? What, what were the Tampa Bay Bandits under Burt Reynolds and John Bassett like? So John Bassett should be in the pro sports hall of fame, pro sports hall of fame. He, he was instrumental in so many things, the World Hockey League, the World Hockey Association, the USFL. John, Bash, John Bassett should be in every single sports hall of fame that he's eligible for. Um, Burt Reynolds' involvement was very hands-on when, when he could. I mean, obviously, right. he was one of the biggest movie stars at the time, and Lonnie Anderson was right there with him. So, but... They, you know, I don't know if you know this, but before the season each year with the Tampa Bay Bandits, they hosted a party called Burt's Bash. No, I didn't know that. Oh, you know what? I'll, uh, I'll text you a picture because I've got a ticket from one of them. Oh, wow. But they hosted Burt's Bash and every Bandits player that I've talked to said Burt was so welcoming. They, I mean, he had it. He had it at the stadium, and then he would have one event at his house where he would invite all the players over, and they, you know, they would go and hang out and everything else. But, but Bert and Bert and Lonnie were very, you know, hands on. They wanted to know what was going on. If you yeah. watch that Bandits documentary, you see Bert a lot, and you see Bert a lot in the stadium because he, he, he wanted, he wanted this a lot. I mean, he was a, he was a Florida state alum. He played yeah. football and Bert, you know, really wanted this to, to work. And the thing is with that team, they let Steve Spurrier coach. They were smart owners. They let Steve coach. And if I remember correctly, there was, I mean, Steve coached the team. That's where, and they took everything and that Tampa stadium, the big sombrero, they had great, they were one of the leaders in, in league attendance, pretty much the entire for the entire run of the league oh yeah tampa those fans got by because if you remember back in 83 i mean now yeah i love the creamsicle uniforms just as much as the next guy i uh -huh. i legit think the buccaneers should bring those back because i thought those uniforms were fantastic they are but 
the Tampa fans, they they are rabid football fans and they needed somebody to a team to lock onto. Right. And they, they locked onto the bandits. And it, and the bandits were a winner right out of the gate. You know, definitely compared to what they had during the fall, you know, with the Buccaneers, because at, at that point the Buccaneers, I think, were pretty much the worst team in the league as they usually let's face it, for most of our lives growing up, they usually have been near the bottom of everything. So, but yeah, they were star for a winner and you see that. I mean, no, they had the, they had the, the horse come running out of the stadium. I think every time they scored a touchdown that horse, they would do like uh, what's what they used. I don't know if they, st- I don't think they still do, but in Kansas city, every time the, the Chiefs scored that horse had run around the stadium. Yeah. And you know, and the, like I said, the, the Buccaneers and football fans were looking for something different and, if you watch any of the football follies videos from that time, yeah, um, you know, the, the Buccaneers were 50% of the video and, you know, and I hate saying that because, because Tom Cato, who's part of our team, he was a, right. he was a Buccaneers and, and bandits fan. So yeah, I, I'm just saying, you, you know, the, the bandits, they, um, they, they really had good attendance. They had good fan support and they had good fan support not only during the season, but in the off season when they, when the players would, you know, go and, and, you know, have other jobs to make ends meet the, the fans were there to support those guys. So Tampa, I mean, and obviously, you know, in that same breath, you know, the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers survived because of the bandits, because once the bandits folded, the football fans had to have somewhere to go. Right. And, I'll tell you this, I don't think the Jacksonville Jaguars. Well, that's what I was just going to actually, you were, you just, you just took the thought right out of my head. That's where I was going with my next question. Um, The Jacksonville Bulls. Listen, if there weren't a Jacksonville Bulls, there'd be no Jacksonville Jaguars. You're exactly right. That they're without, without the Bulls, the Jacksonville Jaguars would not exist. They wouldn't. There's yeah. there's no way because Jacksonville, that city, showed pro football that they wanted a team that they could stand back and support. And if you look at the old photos from Jacksonville, those stands are full. Oh yeah, it is it, those those pictures are way back when, and that you know I mean, you know last week there was a tweet that came out from the Rock about how the XFL battle Hawks have set the all time spring attendance record. And you and I both on Twitter and I do the, I do the XFL info war show, which, you know, kind of look at, go beyond the hype and look and try to get past the BS and just, you know, and you and I were both right there going, what WTF hell no. And it was that the Tampa, I'm sorry, um, Jacksonville, they blew all records because how much, it was over 70,000. I forget the, the, the actual total, but, and they played in the, in at the time it was called the Gator bowl. What was the attendance for that game? Um, what was the attendance for the highest, highest attended? What was the number for the highest attended game in the USFL? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad we got to that subject because I hope Dwayne, the rock Johnson is listening to this podcast because he put out a tweet that is 100% factually inaccurate. He said that the St. Louis Battlehawks set the spring league attendance record at 39,000. Well, Dwayne, if you want to go one on one with a mediocre one, then let's go. <laughs> the USFL from 83 to 85 had 18 games that were over 50,000 people. They had five games that were over 60,000 people. And they had two games that were over 70,000 people. So whenever Dwayne wants to retract that tweet, I'll be right here. And my number is easy to find. (laughs) And that's been, you know, that's been the frustrating thing. You and I are both spring football fans. And I've heard people, a lot of people call me a hater for, for my memes. You know, my memes, I think are spot on. They Mm -hmm. don't, I don't mean to demean. I just like telling the truth through funny memes. I mean, that's it. The reality is, is what the reality is. 
and you're sitting here and I do love your hat. It's an old school. It's a, it's a 47 relax fit Dallas renegades hat. Yep. I love that hat. And it's, I love that style. I got a whole bunch of the same style. I don't, but I don't have any XFL caps, but I love the powder blue too. So, which to me, when it comes to the XFL, I'm still upset that the Roughnecks aren't wearing oiler blue, but oiler Columbia blue, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother sore spot. Cause I'm a, I'm a Houston Roughnecks fan. I know you're an Arlington Renegades fan. Um, but when it comes to spring football, so let's fit, we're fast forward 20. So here we are, we are the first XFL. We obviously know how that all fell apart. But then we move forward almost another 20 years, and it just seems like memories are very, very short when it comes to spring football. We know why spring football in 2000, not only in 2001, but even 10 years before with the World League of American Football, neither one of those succeeded. And there's a variety of factors, but it seemed to me with it was either fan apathy, bad marketing, um, Vince McMahon, bad ratings, but when it comes to the USFL didn't have that. They had great marketing. They had great ratings. They had great attendance. But now fast forward even further. And here we are in what, 2023. And in the course of the last five years, we have seen. Okay, help me out here. I'm going to count. So we got the All-American football. We got, we got the Alliance of American football gone. That was 2019, I want to say. Yeah. Okay. So 2020 XFL version 2.0 failed. And you know what? I'll just call it a draw because pandemic just destroyed everything. Okay. And then we also in there, we had spring league and then they repainted and then they, they slapped a new coat of paint on and, and took over the USFL and became USFL 2.0. And you and I, I know when that came, I mean, I'm just going to tell you my reaction. I'm like, okay, that's not the real USFL. They're just borrowing, you know, uh, it's great. You guys want to honor them, you know, what you're, you know, Doug Flutie came. I'm like, okay, but it's, again, it's a new coat of paint. It was the spring league, but just with the new coat of paint. And then he got, and so here, and then the XFL 3.0 coming out. So. It, to me, it just seemed, and I and I'm I sound exasperated because, listen, you and I both love football. We when when we're not talking, we're talking back and forth. Hey, you watching? The game? Yeah, I'm watching the game. Hey, it's 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 enjoyable football between the lines. I have no complaints because right now we're at a point where we ain't got much football. We got basketball. We got a lot of other sports competing for our attention. So it's nice to have that game. I know the Brahmas are playing right now. Um, uh, after you and I get off here, I'll be watching the very last part of that. But here we are, the spring leagues, it just seems to me, have not read their history books, have not learned from the past. Would you agree on that? I mean, I'm, I hate sounding like a lawyer putting you under, under cross-examination, um, with the, isn't it true type thing. But I, I think you and I are on the same page when it comes to that, because you and I both get frustrated when we see hyperbolic statements coming out by the rock saying, this is the greatest ever. This I'm like, okay, but yeah. Have you guys read a history book? And when he makes a statement, like it's the largest tense ever in spring football. And then the reaction on social media that goes along with it. Oh yeah. It's the greatest. Ever. It's like, Oh my God. It's just, I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm just getting old. Maybe that's it. <laughs> just getting old and exasperated. Well, you know, remember The Rock is a hype machine. So he yeah. grew up in professional wrestling. Right. So he watched his dad in televised, you know, um, you know, set up matches. He's he, he's this is the only thing he knows. And when he succeeded in wrestling, he went to acting and acting is all scripted. And this is the only thing that The Rock knows. And I I get it. I understand, but there's two things that hold the spring legs back. And, and what, before I get into that, let me be clear. I've watched all of these spring legs from the yeah. USFL to the, to the um, world league of American football, 
to the spring league, to the XFL, and I will probably watch a couple of games in what is this new USFL. And you want these leagues to succeed too. I mean, that's the thing. You want these leagues to succeed because these are kids we're talking about that want to make it to the next level. And these are jobs online. So neither you or I want to see any of these leagues fail. No, I mean, I don't want to see any of the leagues fail, but I want them to do it right. Right. And right now I see two things that hold the spring league back. One, if, if somebody would just go back with the USFL or the XFL and pick up the David Dixon plan and see how it works, I think they would be fine. But the bigger problem is the NFL is a monopoly. Yeah. And it has been for years and years and years. Nobody is going to compete with the NFL Unless they, I don't know, unless they get that funding and follow a certain plan, there's nobody that's going to compete with the NFL because they they are and have been a monopoly for a long time. Yeah, and yeah, back when the USFL came into being, you know, the 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 NFL wasn't near as monopolistic as it is obviously today. It's nothing like, I mean the NFL was really just a fall league and that was it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a year round league with a network and a constant hype machine. Um, I mean, every day, I mean, the NFL, to, you know, Dan Patrick, or is it Rich Eisen? One of the two said, um, you know, the NFL is the, uh, gives us a narrative every day, even, even during the off season, yeah. but the USFL, they were the only one really, I mean, the AFL challenged, and there's, you know, people throw the AFL out all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I grew up, I was born in the 60s. I was born when Lombardi coached the Packers and there were 14 NFL teams. And I tell people that, you know, like, what are you talking about? And I go, yeah, there was. Well, I go, yeah, there was the AFL, but those were two separate leagues. And the AFL, I mean, just compare, it's literally apples to oranges as to where we are now. People say, well, the XFL can do this. Yeah, the XFL can do it, but the plan that they're following right now, I don't see a plan. Version 2.0 of the XFL seemed to have a plan. It seemed to be well thought out. Vince McMahon had the ownership, but he was hands off. I mean, ultimately, he's the one that owned, you know, he's he's the one that made the final decision. But as it was going along, I was impressed by how they did things with that second version. The AAF, and I like to call AAF XFL 1.5 because that was Charlie Ebersole's, you know, that that whole thing for that league came out of his dad's experience. Um, But XFL 2.0 seemed to have their shit together. Obviously, pandemic completely destroyed everything. I mean, hell, we almost lost CFL, I think, because of it. But that's a the CFL is a whole different conversation unto itself because it just seems to survive you know it can be lit on fire trounced on but yet they come back i don't you know but they have billionaire owners up there now that seem to be hopefully going to bring them you know make the cfl into what we all hope it can be when it comes to the spring leagues it just seems like you know i just don't know like the xfl right now i really don't know what the plan is because um you know you and i both saw it it's like okay attendance is declining or it's kind of, you know, I'm just going to kind of, without the Battle Hawks, attendance is, you know, it, it, one team cannot hold a league together. And we know about that. Again, for those who have not read their history, go back and read the history of the American, all American football conference. Without the Cleveland Browns, that whole conference, that would have folded quicker than what it did. Um, and, you know, you had two strong franchises, you know, you had the 49ers and you had the Browns. And he kind of had the Colts, but, you know, they ultimately went away. And I think, to me, that's kind of what I'm seeing with the XFL right now. Now, I just got a text from my buddy Dave with XFL, my XFL InfoWars podcast. I'm not watching the Brahmas game right now, but he said it's not a good look with the stands right now um, with the Brahmas game. So we have the Battle Hawks, and that's pretty much about it. I just have been underwhelmed. It's just not a good look when you see empty stadiums. Um, and nowadays our 
And nowadays we are so fragmented when it comes to TV watching. It's not like the old days with the USFL. When the USFL started, we had three channels and that was it. And I think that was part of the reason why the USFL was able to succeed because they were on ABC and ABC fully committed to that league. And if I memory serves me right, and this is where, as I was thinking before we went on, did ABC was USFL did ABC commit to the USFL for the fall 80, 80s? I'm sorry, for the spring 86 and 87 seasons? Um, I don't recall. I don't remember the story there, on that. There were talks about ABC being a part of it, but but ABC was the one that had committed to the USFL from, you know, 83, 84, 85. And there was talks right. about 86, but of course, 86 came and went uh, yeah. really early. But, you know... I know that there are people out there that think that we're just anti XFL. And let me tell you something. I I'm not, I, again, I watch the games. I watch them as a passive fan, but there is a fascinating, in my opinion, a fascinating documentary on Peacock and it's called the Monday night wars. Oh, and I have not about, seen this one. Have you seen it? No. Oh, the Monday Night Wars is fantastic. Oh, okay. Now tell me more. Tell me more. It it details the WWF at the time, WWE, going up against World Championship Wrestling when there were two major wrestling promotions and they were right. fighting for you know fans, attendance, everything else. But the thing I like about that documentary is it not only tells you what was going on at the time in each episode, but it right. shows you the ratings. And that to me is key. It's showing you what the ratings were for each show as things happened. Right. And it, I mean, it's, it's a, okay. it's a long documentary. It's broken down into, into parts. I, I want to say it's well, I want to say it's probably 18, 19 episodes. Oh, but, wow. but they jump oh, into okay. a lot of different things that were going on when these two major companies were going head to head. And that's the problem is they the NFL has not had a major competitor since the USFL because these guys aren't following different plans to try to build. They've got to build viewership. And I'll give the XFL all the credit in the world. They're moving their TV schedule around. They're trying to get different games and different time slots so that, you know, so that they can get more viewership. But at the end of the day, if you don't come up with some type of plan yeah. to, to try to do this full time. And, and I'll say this too, the XFL has an investment group that's behind them. Right. You know what I know about investment groups? They like to make money. Invest, investment groups like their money and they yeah. do not want to lose money. And I can tell you right now that that cord will be pulled really quickly if the XFL doesn't turn some type of profit or at least show that they can turn some type of profit. Yeah. And, you know, we're reaching, you know, talking about ratings and everything and people get hung up. And this is what frustrates me. You know, so we see the ratings that come out and, you know, there's a lot of spin that gets put out by the XFL media. I'm not going to name names, but, you know, you and I both know, you and I both know who that is. And we've talked about that offline. Um, you know what? It's great. I understand you're trying to spin the positive on ratings. Well, but in this time slot, but here's the bottom line, at least in my opinion, your overall numbers are dropping. And the, the one thing, Thing I hear constantly, and I, I understand why I hear it, but hey, we don't know what the streaming numbers are. Like, okay, you've got a point. But as somebody who has to stream, I'm over on the other side of the world. I have to use a VPN to actually access, you know, ESPN Plus. I know this much about the XFL when it comes to streaming. I have to physically go look for that channel to get the XFL games on ESPN Plus. It's not like I'm flipping through the channel, sitting down on my couch going, okay, what's on? Flip, 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 boom, football game. So, yeah, 
I'm sure the numbers obviously are going to be higher with streaming, but I don't know, just based on my own experience trying to figure out where to find the games, I don't think the the ratings for streaming are going to add that much of a boost. And even if they do, listen, I always, and I harp on this and may, and Kyle, am I imagining things, but when you've looked at those ratings, has the USFL games, have they beat the Real Housewives in the ratings? Because every time I see it, it just seems like, Real Housewives is always right above the highest rated game. And I'm just like, listen, you need to be able to beat out your competition in cable. It's great you're in the top 50, but man, if you can't beat out a Real Housewives on Bravo, then yeah, I don't I don't see it as a win. I mean, it's not a loss, but definitely not a win. So that's just my take on it. Well, here's my take on it. And you know, I, I may have shared this before. I may not. This may be breaking news. I don't know if you've got a sounder, but for me, these XFL fanatics, and again, there's a difference between being passionate about football right. and being a fanatic because the word fan is, is a derivative of a fanatic. fanatic. Yeah. For me, these fans are paying to watch practice squad football with better uniforms Mm -hmm. that I I mean, I love that these guys are getting a chance. I love that they're getting paid to play pro football. I, I, I love that. Like deep in my heart, I love that these guys are getting a chance. Yeah. But as my dad would say, you can polish a turd, but it's still a turd. Yeah. I mean, you are, they, these, these people are praising Practice squad football, like like it's the the next best thing, and it's not. Right. If the XF if the XFL wants to make a splash, go after the people that are going to be in the NFL draft or the NFL draft in April. Go yeah, after, ma- yeah. yeah. Go make it. go sign go sign somebody that's going to be in the first round, and go make a splash. If the yeah. USFL wants to do the same thing. Right. Go do it, but you're not going to make a yeah. splash signing these guys that have had their opportunity and let it go. Right. I mean, the CFL figured that out years ago. I mean, they knew they couldn't spend money, but the one time they had decent owners, I'm sorry, they had owners with really deep pockets of money back in 91, which I can't, they signed rocket, but they knew, listen, this is, this is just to get asses in the seats. We know we can't hold, we're, we, we can't afford this guy for too long. So let's give him. Um, but yeah, the USFL and, and the XFL, if they really want to be taken seriously, yeah, they'll make a splash. I mean, I mean, really money talks and, but right now, yeah, we are watching, you know, it's, it's, we're watching single for, to use a good baseball analogy, we're, we're watching maybe single a or double a ball right now. And I think double a ball might be a stretch. I mean, the USF, uh, sorry, but the CFL. Listen, I love the CFL. I mean, it's from the 55 yard line. We're CFL fans, but we are we we are real, you know, realistic to know that, you know, a lot of these guys, I mean, this is in many ways with the CFL, I can I equate it to AAA baseball. Yeah. Um, these are some great guys, but you know, then you got your double A's and but when it comes to like XFL fans, I mean, USFL fans to me have always had a great sense of humor, same with CFL fans self-deprecate um can, you know it's like you can laugh at yourself xfl fans are just i'm you know i mean i'm big on my memes and everything but i think my memes speak a lot of truth too but they do not they they take this a little bit overly seriously when it comes to their fandom going you know we've seen this on, on facebook you know all these plans for expansion and god love them you know maybe they just got too much time on their hands or, or what have you and i understand their passion but guys, hold the hold the phone on expansion. You need before you can expand the league, you need to have a league that at least gets ten thousand people in asses in the seats consistently for every game. Yeah, this six thousand, seven thousand, nine thousand stuff—it just ain't going to work with only one team in St. Louis. You know, making up the difference—it just—it's just not going to work. I mean. Um, No, you're right. You're exactly right. I mean, St. Louis can't carry that entire league. And, you know, and to further our conversation from before, and, and I apologize, this is the only name I can come up with on the creation list right now. 
But if the XFL or the USFL wants to make a splash, go make an offer to Dalton Schultz. He's one of the best free agents that still doesn't have a team right now. He's a tight end. I know that's that's not a sexy position. Right. But if if they want to make a splash, go through that NFL free agent list and and make an offer to Dalton Schultz or Lamar. Yes, make it make an offer to Lamar Jackson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, clear. Yeah, I, I mean, you know what? I I hear OBJ's looking for something to do. Right. I mean, yeah. go go at least. I mean. Especially The Rock. He grew up in the wrestling world. He yeah. grew up in the promotion world. He grew up in the look at me world. Right. Go make offers to those guys. I guarantee you The Rock knows OBJ. Yeah. Yeah. And go, go make an offer to that guy and right. say, listen, we're we're gonna, you know, we're we're gonna try to get you back in the NFL or we're gonna, you know, go against our you know salary cap, whatever it is, but we want you to come and play in our league. Right. Go make it, him an offer. Talk and, to him. And if they would put that much effort into stuff like that instead of, you know, hey, guess what? We've got a new sponsor for our league. It's my tequila brand. It's my energy drink brand. You know, if they put that type of effort into getting, you know, to making a splash with signings, yeah, it's going to cost you money. But right now, dude, you're losing, you're, you're hemorrhaging money no matter what. But, the, you know, but signing a big name, might lessen in the rate you know your ratings are definitely going to go up at least for you know for for a little bit but i you know but maybe that'll happen next season though i'm not convinced because i thought they listen i thought we walked into the season i thought okay redbird capital coming in oh i'm sure they it's much like when we invaded iraq oh Mm -hmm. i'm sure we got a plan i'm sure i mean i sat in briefing rooms before we invaded iraq going and i turned to fellow ensign i go so then what I don't know. I mean, it just seems to me like, okay, they were going to launch this league, but they had no plan moving forward other than, hey, we're going to be able to sell more energy drinks and be able to sell more tequila. But then you hear fans saying, hey, I'm waiting on merchandise. I'm, I'm... There's a lot of stuff that's happening with this league that I don't think Vince McMahon would have allowed to happen if this were under his watch. So it's very frustrating, obviously, for you and I watching this because we can see how this is kind of, History, in a way, is kind of, it seems like, in some ways, repeating itself. But now we're moving into, we are in March. Obviously, this this weekend is a make or break, I think, for the U.S., or, sorry, for the XFL. Because you've got March Madness. You've got World Baseball Classic. You've got a lot of other things are on the plate. And, that, and we live in such a fragmented, we, TV viewership is so fragmented now, unlike the days with the USFL, where you had four channels. And, you know, the networks went with the the stuff that they knew everybody was going to tune in on. But back in the 80s, people watched the USFL. People, I mean, you know, all three championships. And that was must-see TV. And those were some great games, too. Um, So before we go, any parting thoughts in terms of uh, just with the USFL project, where we're going, what's coming on with Spring? We're going to talk more on other episodes down down the road, obviously. Uh, especially as uh, you know, we move deeper, deeper into. We'll talk more spring football probably on my XFL Infowars show, and uh, and also a little bit more and more on Gridiron America. But before we wrap everything up, to um, any final thoughts in terms of just where we're at now with spring football, and has the spring foot has this renaissance with spring football? Have you guys noticed that uh, uptick in traffic to your to the USFL project? Um, yeah, we've noticed an uptick in traffic, but, but it's, you know, it, it's a lot of people that are looking to talk about the current XFL, USFL, which we don't do. I mean, we, that's one of our main rules, but, but no, we still, I mean, on a daily basis, we're still growing and we're still thankful for that because we, we want people to remember the original USFL and we want them to be a part of our group and, and, you know, and see everything that's posted in there. Um, what's coming up next for spring football, man, if they don't, 
if they don't change some things, I don't think we're going to have spring football in probably about three years. And I hate to say that. I really, really, really hate to say that. But, you know, the XFL, the investors are going to come calling. The USFL, they've already got a season under their belt. And now they're going to expand to, you know, one or two more cities. I, I just don't. I don't see the current model being able to sustain a a long-term deal. I really right. don't. And I and I want them to. Again, yeah. I I want these leagues to succeed, but the way they're going about it, I don't I don't think it's going to work. And again, Rock, Danny, if you're out there, I mean, let let's talk. Let's talk about sustainability. Let's talk about long-term ventures. But the way it's going right now, it's not going to work. Yeah. Now I'm on the same page with you. And uh, yeah, you and I, I mean, I, 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 after we wrap up and, you know, hit the stop button and, and you go back to basketball, I, you're probably, you and I are probably going to go catch the last of the last, the last half of the, the XFL game here. But no I, sure. I'm right. I am right there with you because it's just it. It's yeah. I it just you know, and that's the frustrating part. Why? Why do you hate? Why are you hating on the XFL? Why are I go because history is repeating itself, and um, you know, kind of goes back to what I said. Those who are you know, you and I, we're st- his, we're we're students of we are students of the history of the game, and it it gets very frustrating when you see. I mean, the NFL obviously is paying attention and they're reading their history, and there's a reason now why the NFL is a 24 hour, seven days a week, 365 days of the year league. And, but the flip side is too, the, the, U, the NFL, you know, also couldn't get spring football to work. The only league that has made it work was the USFL. And because of, because of the, not one person, but because of many people, that league went away. It, it was, had they stuck with the Dixon plan, you know, we probably have the USFL today in some form spring. Definitely. You know, I can, I can see a, you know, an alternate universe where USFL does exist, um, you know, as a compliment. And again, you never know. I mean, there could have been a time where the NFL and the USFL, much like the NFL and the AFL said, okay, we got to stop this. We've got to come together mm-hmm. and they could have worked out something. So well, listen, my friend. With all that said, here we've been we've been going quite a while here, and I've taken up a good part of your your evening here. And uh, it's a sunny day here in Japan, so I'm going to be heading out here after we hit the stop button. But hey, thank you very much for sitting down with me. I've really enjoyed this today because uh, you know I've wanted to talk to you for years, and it just I, up until now I just never have really had it had had the opportunity to do it. So we're going to be able to do more of this. I hope. Absolutely. And I, you know, and I appreciate it. And I, you know, I want to piggyback on what you said here at the end. Um, The people that see us as XFL haters, they have to realize that we understand business. There is a business aspect to this. And I've always been told, if you want to find the truth, follow the money. And what we're doing is we're following the money back to what the XFL and the USFL are doing. And again, right now, I mean, we, we want this to work, but it is, it, it simply from the outside, because we're not insiders from the outside, it doesn't seem to be working. So we're not haters. We're realists. Right. And And everything is, and the the XFL works between the lines. Cause I mean, I'm not, you know, the, the quality of play, while obviously it's not NFL, CFL, or even college football, it's still football. And these kids are out there busting their tail to get mm-hmm. noticed, and they're playing with heart. So on the field, I, we, you and I have not, never never voiced a complaint. Actually, there have been some innovations the XFL is trying that I kind of like. Yeah. But it's outside the lines that, you know, it's it, that's how it's always been with these leagues. Outside the lines – it's been the business people that screw it up for the people that are playing that are, that are, you know, 
And, uh, you know, that's what happened in the seventies with the world football league, the eighties with the USFL, the nineties with the world league of American football and so on and so forth. So with all that said, Kyle, on behalf of, on behalf of Kyle and myself, thank you much, uh, you know, Kyle, thank you very much for sitting down with me and, uh, Let's uh, let's have another conversation very soon. I appreciate it, my friend. Man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on, and let's go. All right. Before I before we let you go here, man, tell everybody how to find the USFL project and uh, and find all and see all the great things on there. Uh, right now, just go to Facebook and search the USFL project. You can find the page. You can find the group. The group is way more um, active. So. Go to the USFL Project on Facebook and join our group. There's a couple of rules, but we would absolutely love to have you. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Kyle, for sitting down with me and for everybody listening. Uh, plan on uh, I'll be talking to you very, very soon. As it's uh, my life here in Japan has has been going, I've been able to sit down with everybody. You know, somebody once a week talking football history for for Gridiron America, and. Uh, you know, hopefully uh, soon we're going to have a World Football League uh, conversation coming up. Scott will be back with us. It's just a matter of time zones and challenges and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, that really, it's really interesting too, Kyle. Before I let you go, lining up things in Japan with time zones and talking back to America for me, it's very cathartic. I mean, this is in many. I'll 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 be be blunt. This is I I'm selfish. This helps me because I don't feel. I feel like America is just right across the street instead of half a world away to be able to talk football. But for those listening, Hey, Scott will be back here hopefully sooner rather than later. And um, thank you very much for tuning in. Bye-bye. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network Back in 2020, with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.